Good evening, everyone. My name is Brock McMillan. It is six o'clock on August 31st, and I'll call this meeting to order. Um, welcome to the Central Region Advisory Council meeting. Uh, this meeting is being held in person at the DWR Central Region in Springville, as well as being streamed live on YouTube in the public. This is a public forum allowing you to express your opinions and proposals on the management of wildlife in our state. This RAC considers your ideas, opinions, and proposals and reports them to the Wildlife Board. The Wildlife Board, not the RAC, is, is charged with setting wildlife policy for the state of Utah. We all have our ideas and opinions about what's best for, the, for Utah's wildlife, and we approach this with tremendous emotion and passion. I'd appreciate all who wish to express their opinion to do so. However, I'd ask that we all respect each other's uh, opinions and opposing views. I'd appreciate the audience keeping their emotions in check, allowing all individuals to freely express their opinions. Appropriate conduct will provide a smooth meeting flow, allow the RAC to listen, digest, and address all the concerns, opinions, and proposals offered. Uh, don't be rude. Uh, I'd welcome all the RAC members and we'll go through and do introductions. So we'll start with Mike Christensen. Mike Christensen at large. Eric Reed, BLM. Uh, Jim Schuler, non consentum. Uh, Chase Crandall, Ag. Ken Strong, Sportsman's Rep. And Scott Jensen, public at large. And then online, I believe we have Josh. Uh, yeah, thanks, Brock. Joshua Leonard, Sportsman's Rep. And I don't see AJ. AJ said that he'd be joining us online, um, but AJ Maurer will be here as well. We definitely have a quorum. Uh, I'd also like to welcome the DWR staff, spe specifically those that have provided presentations and are available to answer questions. Those include Riley Peck, uh, the once in a lifetime coordinator. Oh, there he is, okay. And uh, Chris Penny, the Northern Region Aquatics Manager. So look, say welcome to the public that are attending in person or watching on YouTube. Those that are attending in person will have the opportunity to comment regarding any agenda item. If you wish to make a comment, you need to fill out one of the yellow cards that is on the table where you come in. Uh, you can hand that to, to Mike here on the end and he'll pass it up to the front if you have a comment. Uh, the public that are watching on YouTube will not be able to provide live comments during the meeting. However, the presentations were provided in advance and you should have had a chance to provide comments on the online format. Uh, I'll entertain uh, a, a motion for approval of the agenda and pass minutes. So moved. Excellent, thank you. We have a, uh, a motion to approve the agenda and, and the pass minutes and a second. All those in favor, raise your hand. Josh, I'm looking at you, excellent. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. I'll give a, a brief update from the Wildlife Board now. Um, there was a motion from the Wildlife Board to approve the Bobcat recommendations as prevent, presented, and that uh, motion passed unanimously. Uh, there was a motion to prohibit the taking of collared lions with the use of hounds, excluding any depredation take for the next three years. Uh, that motion passed five in favor, one opposed. Uh, there was a motion to approve the remaining of the Cougar recommendations as presented by the division. That motion passed unanimously. There was a motion to uh, accept the expo permit audit as presented. That motion passed unanimously. Uh, there was a motion to approve the drought permits as presented. That motion passed unanimously. And then there was a motion to, for, the, to move the, the division pool agenda items five and six from the September RAC meeting agenda. That's where most of the comments that we received online came from, those two agenda items having to deal with technology and the use of cameras. And that motion passed unanimously. So we will not be discussing those agenda items in tonight's meeting. Um, and that's what I have for uh, 
a summary of the last board meeting. I'll now turn the time over to Jason Vernon for an update from the region. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair, I appreciate it. Um, and again, welcome everybody here for tonight's meetings. I just have a, a few brief updates I'd like to give the RAC members. Um, earlier this summer, as we recognized that it was gonna be a, a probably a severe drought, um, as an agency, we decided to put fire closures and uh, shooting closures in place on our WMAs. Most of our WMAs across the state are at lower elevations, um, sage, brush areas and we've, last year we had I think six fires start on our WMAs due to shooting. So we wanted to be proactive this year. Um, we put a closure in place, it's uh, worked really well. Uh, with the rains that we've been getting over the last couple of weeks and the green up we've seen on these WMAs, we've decided to lift that closure uh, starting September 7th. So I believe that's next Tuesday, September 7th. So we're excited about that and uh, get people back out there recreating on those WMAs and those fashions. Uh, also in our habitat section, it's, it's that time of the year where we start ramping up our wildlife restoration projects. So um, we have a lot of people out on the ground uh, doing good things for habitat out there. Uh, we're excited about the, the projects this fall, we've got several really large projects on the Manti that we're really excited about on the on the west side of the Manti this year. So they're, they're busy doing that. Um, also, we've talked about guzzlers in the past. Um, I know in some areas of the state, there's been a challenge with keeping water in those guzzlers, especially some of those big game guzzlers. We've been pretty fortunate in the central region. Uh, we've have had to go out and fill a guzzler here and there throughout the summer but these monsoonal storms that have come through recently have basically topped off a lot of the guzzlers out on the desert. So we're, we're extremely happy about that. We'll keep our eye on it, uh, but we don't anticipate having to, to go back out and, and haul water to those guzzlers. In our outreach section, um, one of the things we look, to, look forward to annually is our Kokanee Salmon Viewing Day that's traditionally held at Strawberry Reservoir, just right next to the visitor center. Uh, we weren't able to hold it last year because of the concerns with COVID-19. Uh, this year we will be holding the celebration. It'll be on September 18th, which is a Saturday, and it'll run from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And we're excited, we weren't exactly sure, and this kind of runs into our aquatic section, you know, what would happen with the, the water in the river and the, and the fish starting to run. Um, but. It's, we're getting reports that the kokanee are already starting to run at Strawberry River despite the low flows. So we anticipate that we'll have a great viewing day there this year. Um, also in aquatics, um, again, with, uh, with the drought, many of our reservoirs have been extremely low this year. Um, and they, they went low early. Um, but I, we were able to avoid fish kills in those, uh, we liberalized the limits on some of those reservoirs, or we didn't stock some of those reservoirs as we typically have in the past. Um, so they're low and we, I think we're maybe in the clear for a minute, um, but we're hoping for some water to fill those back up for the next year. In our wildlife section, of course, um, tis the season for hunts. We've got several hunts going on right now. We've got the general season, um, archery buck and bull and, and spike all going on right now. Tomorrow begins the upland game season. We've got morning doves and, and rabbits and grouse and tarbigan and, and uh, a handful of other species out there that we'll be hunting. So we're excited for that as well. Um, of course, along with all of that activity on the mountain, our law enforcement is also extremely busy out there uh, making contacts with the public and, and hunters and uh, they'll be doing that basically the, the rest of the year living on the mountain more or less. So that's all I have to report, Mr. Chair, unless there's any questions from the RAC members. Okay. Mike, you have a question? Yeah, I've got kind of a question and a comment and I hope this is the appropriate time to do it because um, we're talking about our central region and one, one, there's something that's concerning to me that the comment period lasts for three days for the central and northern region for these presentations. 
but the southern, southeastern, and northeastern region, they get 11 days for their public to comment. And there's about 3.3, 3.4 million people that live in Utah. 2.8-ish million of those reside in the central and northern regions. And so we're disallowing our constituents that live in our region and those in the northern region to have that same opportunity to comment. And I think that that, to me, that's kind of an issue. Um, when 85% of Utah's public um, you know, really don't have that same opportunity. I mean, so, so many people didn't even know the comment period was open and then it was closing. So I would, I don't know how we address that. I, I think a lot of it is, it's a timing issue with uh, getting the presentations ready, getting all the data in and trying to squeeze that into a time period um, to, to get this meeting off the ground and going. Yeah. Um, I, I'm more than happy to, to talk with uh, our staff and see what we can do. If we can extend that period to, to more days. I think when we initially started this process, we had more days, but it, it ended up making or having to work on weekends and Sundays and things mm -hmm. like that, which um, is, is a challenge for us. But, you know, if, if it's something we need to readdress, we can certainly do that. I, th I think one, I mean, if it's, Maybe we just close it for the whole state, you know, so everybody gets the same amount of time to, to discuss it. You know, if it's three days in the central and northern and, you know, the rest of the state, then, then fair is fair. And I'm not trying to put a burden on the division. I just don't think it's appropriate that we allow three days for 85% of the public and 11 days for 15%. I think that's an excellent comment, Mike. So thank I'm glad you. to pass that on. Thank you. You bet. I failed to do two things. We excuse Ben Louder. Uh, he had a scheduling conflict, I guess you call it that. He's in Alaska. <laughs> and I'd also like to recognize uh, two wildlife board members that are in attendance. We have Gary Nielsen that's in attendance in person and Carl Hurst is, attendant, is attending online. And so welcome Gary and Carl, thank you very much. Anything else? Okay, we'll move to our first agenda item, which is number seven uh, on our uh, agenda here, which is once in a lifetime species recommendations. Um, we will start with uh, questions from the RAC members for Riley. I do have a question, Riley. Yeah. Why are, are some species have really consistent seasons like the moose? Every, every unit in the state has the same exact species season. And like bighorn sheep, there are five different any weapon seasons, <clears throat> not including the ones that have multiple seasons on the same use, unit, right. they're just all over the place. Yeah, I mean, if we look at bighorn sheep as the example, you mentioned the first one, we have units that we hunt where we try for perceived crowding or crowding issues to split a hunt into multiple season dates. And so we'll have different start and end dates for essentially the same unit. And so that's that's probably the first reason. Uh, the second is if we have a, an archery only hunt, we don't wanna place those on top of a rifle hunt and our bighorn sheep have a few of those units that are extended arch or archery only. So we'll have those as different start dates. Uh, another one is an effort to try and not overlap species hunts. Once in a lifetime species, you're not required to wear hunter orange. And so you try not to put them on another rifle hunt where one is required to wear hunter orange. Uh, there are probably other answers to that. I don't know how many of them are, you know, completely adequate. I think that uh, if we're being honest too, with bighorn sheep across the state, uh, our once in a lifetime hunters want to hunt during the prime rut and timing for rut activity with bighorn sheep varies greatly across the Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep and desert bighorn sheep. And so uh, we have deer that are legislated to when we should start bighorn sheep, you know, we get the option to have that within our management plan. So some of our animals outside of deer, you know, vary a lot more for those reasons. Some of them are a lot more tight, but yeah, good question. So follow up on that. Why, why are some not, I understand when you split a hunt into two seasons and you have, you're going to say, we're going to give 
this group of hunters the first month and this group of the hunters the other month. But some units that only have one hunt, some are like just over three weeks long and some are over two months long. Why is there such a variation in season length among the seasons? I, I think the goal always for once in a lifetime species is to give you as much time as possible. Uh, we, we recognize that one of the recommendations tonight is on the Zion unit where we had hunter crowding and we traditionally had that split into two. Now with less permits offered, we tried to combine that and give them as much opportunity as possible. So if there is an option to give them more time, then once in a lifetime species are managed for 100% success. And if we can give them more time, we do. If there are other conflicts then that come into play, then the season dates are adjusted. That was that was the point of my question is uh, it'd be nice to give hunters the as much time as possible. It seems weird, awesome, seems odd to me that some hunts they only get three weeks and other hunts they get two and a half months. So I, I don't disagree with that. And we can, we'd be happy to look into the dates of any hunt. If you had any specific that you would want us to reevaluate, we'd be happy to do that. Anyway, I just wanted to try to understand what yeah. was going on. Yeah, there's multiple reasons and I think they're all valid and all good, but Honestly, it's a mixed bag as to why the hunt starts when it does. And I, uh, our biologists do a great job and I, I think the dates are pretty sharp, but. Perfect, thanks Riley. always be improved upon. Uh, go ahead, Ken. Question on the Zion. Uh, you dropped it from two to one. Is that gonna create overcrowding or did you cut the tags enough to prevent so, that so today we are not recommending any permit numbers and so largely that'll be decided when that goes through the rack and the board the first part of the winter um or in the in the winter come february but we anticipate the numbers being cut enough that uh, we would not need both hunts and the crowding would not be an issue. That is, we are anticipating that for our, our recommendation. We don't know what that would be. You guys haven't weighed in on it. The board certainly hasn't voted on it, uh, but just in anticipating that we'd have enough to put it back into one hunt is why we made the recommendation the way we did. So in, in that vein, I just wanted to ask a question relative to the change in when we're when we're dealing with this. We had a busy November previously, so you guys have done a great job in separating some of that stuff out. If come spring, when you have counts again, um, and you decide you've got more permits that you wanna allocate, have we put ourselves in a bind now because we've dealt with season dates here that we can't address that so, in the future? Or what's the plan? So that's a really good question. Like uh, in an effort to try and consolidate racks and boards as much as possible. So some are not five hours long and others 10 minutes. We tried to bring this to the September rack process. The, the challenge with that is for once in a lifetime species, we're still collecting data. And so I have a, an updated recommendation for us today uh, regarding goats that I would like us all to consider. That being said, uh, we're largely keeping the season dates and the hunt structure for most of our hunts the same and permit numbers will be recommended at that time. Uh, we may add, recommend an additional permits or decreasing permits, but very seldom do we make a recommendation to get rid of a hunt altogether. Uh, with that being said, our biologist in the Northern region just finished flying goats just this past weekend. And on our Chalk Creek Camas unit, uh, we had a much lower hunt or much lower count than anticipated and we counted 22 total animals. Uh, we, we feel like the count was good, but we certainly feel like we missed maybe some nanny kid groups. And so in talking to the biologists and the managers in that area, uh, we would like to recommend um, and this is not in the rack packet. Like I said, in, in trying to keep this as consolidated as possible, one of the challenges we're getting ongoing data, we'd like to recommend doing away with the non-resident permit. Typically in our plan, we give 10% of the permits to non-residents and we anticipate that we will be recommending lower than five and making a recommendation of not having a resident permit on that. So that is not in the rack packet. That is something completely new. That is something we will be addressing at all of the five racks and then making that final recommendation to the board. But I felt like that kind of goes along with your question in that, yes, we're coming earlier. We're trying not to, to make November as heavy as it has been in the past, but it does come with some consequences. 
So let me get this straight, Riley. So you're recommending no, no permit or no non-resident hunt? Because we don't do permit numbers here. No just... non-resident hunt. Right. I yes. just wanted to clarify. Thank you for that clarification. If I said that wrong, we do not. Today we're creating the hunt structure and, and dates for once in a lifetime species. We essentially do not want to create a basket for somebody to put in for a hunt that there's no prize to win, if I can put it that simply. So to be clear, you're you're anticipating this hunt will have just a couple of permits, one or two, we, three, something like that? We anticipate that we will certainly have less than five that we are going to recommend. And and certainly the board could see this differently and, and recommend six, seven, eight permits, and at which time we would normally give a non-resident permit, but due to this recommendation, we would be without one for the year. So it doesn't tie the hand of the board and how many permits they can recommend when that time comes. It just states that we are pulling the non-resident permit off the books for this hunt or making that recommendation, if that makes sense. Thank and you. that's just for the bighorn sheep? That is just for mountain goats on the one unit in the Chalk mountain Creek goats? Camas, yes. What, what has the trend been on that unit for population numbers? Is this a substantial so we, big increase? Yeah, all at it's, once? it's a substantial decrease for sure. We flew last time in 2017 and we counted 104 goats. We've offered somewhere in the ballpark of nine to 12 permits over the last three to four years with uh, ranging from 92 to 100%. It has been a successful hunt, but we, due to drought and difficult winters and just climatic events, we believe uh, we've had lower than normal goats. So, so do we have collars on these goats? Is it it's uh, a migration this, issue? You think it's a mortality issue and a recruitment issue? Then? So we don't completely know if I'm going to be completely honest at this moment. We don't have collars on there. We do have plans to put collars on this this year, though. So hopefully we will get a better idea moving forward. So since since the last time you surveyed, we had that severe winter where all the deer died in that area with an abundance of lions. I mean, I wonder if there was any prey switching up there. So there, certainly that could be the case, but I mean, if we're being honest, this is this is one of those events that we're hoping to gain more information on, and I don't have a, an educated answer for you at the, at the moment. Yeah, Riley, just um, in general, on your once in a lifetime hunts, is the age class and quality of the animals changing over time, in addition to the numbers? So goats might be one of those where you certainly see the age class and the quality of the animal change. It is a neither sex permit typically, and so you might be seeing them shoot us a younger age class or even even more nannies, and so that may be changing over time. Uh, I'd, I'd have to go back to the data to answer that question completely, but that is not out of the realm of the imagination, especially for goats. It wouldn't be as likely for other species. Question for you, Riley. On the Nebo archery mountain goat hunt, it goes until October 2nd, but the rifle hunt there starts October 1st. Okay. And when we talked about having these hunts, we didn't want to overlap them because of... So, right. So generally speaking, that is, that is a goal. Another factor that comes into play when we're talking with mountain goats is the typical elevation at which we are hunting them, road closures because of the Forest Service, the ability to access them. There are many factors, especially on mountain goats, that come into play as well. And, and maybe Rusty has more information or light on that specific unit in his region, but I believe that that a lot of the dates for mountain goats are, are surround, centered around access and the ability to get to them at certain times of the year. So I understand that, but to me that doesn't, you know, having it go for an extra day for the archery hunters, or two days actually, because it would be the first and the second. Um, that just seems, I mean, it seems like they got it backwards because you'd want the one to end on a Friday and the other one to start on a Saturday though, yeah. but rather than one end, end on Saturday and one start on Friday. Yeah, and that, that's kind of, that one, that one perplexes me a little bit just because, so I know some guys that archery hunt mountain goats and they put on a white sheet or a white sure. clothing to get in close to the mountain goats and now we're turning them into, you know, potential targets and issues and, and where you don't have to wear hunter orange for once in a lifetime. I'm uncomfortable with that that end date. I just want to put that out there. Okay. So. Right in, I'll be happy to look into that as well. I don't. 
So, okay. Other questions for Riley? Hey, hey Brock, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Josh. I want to change the subject off of sheep unless somebody else has a sheep question or a goat question. Go ahead, Josh. Um, Riley, I was looking at the boundary change for the bison, uh, Bitter Creek, roadless area. Yeah. And I was trying to get a better dial on it. I have the map pulled up right now, and I wonder if you could maybe help distinguish for me that that northern reader, re, northern uh, uh, boundary change for that and how and how it got set and why, because I, I, I couldn't quite tell the boundary change and I'm trying to understand the, the rationale. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd love to speak to that. So we have the southern portion of the Book Cliffs unit uh, that over the last few years has increased in bison density. We've been getting a lot more of our bison hanging out there permanently. On top of that, uh, as we survey our hunters and we discuss that, that is an underutilized area for our hunters. It does not get access very much. And most of those that draw the, the Book Cliffs area do not go down into that south portion. Um, so that's the first part. The second part is, we are also seeing an increased number of bison in the roadless area. And as we increase the number of permits there to try and address the harvest, we are, it's, it's relatively small. It seems huge when you're on foot, but to a bison, they can be pushed out of the roadless area quite easily. So in an effort to address the amount of harvest that we need and also pro provide an opportunity for hunters that that may want to hunt a different location without pushing the bison out. We've combined or made the recommendation to combine the south portion of the roadless or south portion of the book cliffs with the roadless as one unit and then leave everything to the north of that as the other unit. So uh, in the presentation, it looks as though, Josh, we are, we're making two different or two brand new hunts. And the reality is we are just addressing the boundary. The south portion of that book cliffs unit uh, is much more difficult to access. There's a lot less roads, trails. It lends itself and is a lot more similar to the roadless portion of the book cliffs. And so we're hoping that it just meets the, the needs of that hunt a little bit better without putting the pressure, the bison don't leave. Uh, that was the idea behind the boundary change for that. And, and, and so basically, I'm just trying to understand it again. You're, you're adding that Bitter Creek unit, which I'm not as familiar with, to that roadless southern portion so that folks who potentially draw a late season hunt or the roadless hunt also have an opportunity to hunt the, the Bitter Creek section of that as well. Is that right? The that's right. The south portion of that Bitter Creek will now be combined with the roadless Little Creek unit and will then be the roadless Little Creek. It is adding additional hunt, additional space to that boundary. And do you feel like, I mean, you said the southern region in general is underutilized. Do you feel like the Bitter Creek is underutilized and or the roadless is underutilized? Because those seem like two different yeah, and I don't know if I made myself clear. So let me let me start over, Josh, because either you're confused or I'm confused or we're all confused. And so I'll I'll, I'll try again. So we have uh, the Bitter Creek, which there is a south portion to that, and I typically have called that just the Book Cliffs in the past, but it's the Book Cliffs Bitter Creek. The south portion of that area has been underutilized with those that drew the tag. Not many hunters go after that when they are harvesting their bison. They stay to the north portion of that unit. A lot of times when we add the number of permits necessary to get the harvest we need on the roadless or the Little Creek area, we will provide enough pressure on the bison that they will leave. And in an effort to uh, spread out and give a better opportunity and also utilize some area that is underutilized, we add the south portion of the Bitter Creek to the Little Creek unit. So we're just taking a chunk from the north and adding it to the road list to create the two separate boundaries. 
I hope that I'm not confusing you more as I'm trying to address this. Hopefully that that explained it a little better. No, no, that's great. I couldn't I couldn't understand sort of the ultimate aim, but that helps clarify it a lot. Thanks a lot, Riley. So historically, you've had the roadless, which is really the western portion of the unit, and then you've had the whole east, north, and south, which is the Bitter Creek. Right. And you've taken everything south of the ridge and added Adding to the roadless. Adding to the roadless. Thank you, Brock. Okay, Mr. Now, Chair. I, now I'm confused. <laughs> so why why do we have a Bitter Creek South that includes the roadless and a roadless unit? Hunt, the, we don't, on we don't anymore. We, I shouldn't, that's presumptuous of me. We're, re, we're making a recommendation to not. Okay, I'm, well, I'm looking at, maybe I'm wrong here. So looking at hunt B, BI6519. So the recommendation today moving forward, forward would be to take the south portion of the Bitter Creek unit, mm -hmm. south of the highway and add that to the roadless portion becoming the Book Cliffs Little Creek unit. So then what's the Book Cliffs and Bitter Creek South unit? That is so, BI6523. So that, the, the Book Cliffs Bitter Creek would then be the everything north of that highway and the area traditionally utilized by the bison, north of the ridge. Okay, so, so it just, so, we're, we're well, talking so, about, it. oh, go ahead, Josh. Well, so now roadless hunters have the option of hunting the Bitter Creek South, if I'm understanding it right. So they've they've essentially signed up for a, a roadless hunt with an additional uh, roaded area within their own unit. That that is correct. Uh, that and it's the portion of the unit with the least amount of roads. Relatively speaking, it has the least amount of cattle and horses. And so we do not get some of those trails that you're familiar with if you've been or spent any time out on the book cliffs. And so it, it, for all intents and purposes, relates a lot more to the road list than the rest of the book cliffs. Okay, so then what's BI 6523? What hunts uh, that? I'm sorry, I don't know. It's the called the book the... cliffs Bitter Creek South. Is that the choice. recommendation or yeah. is that one that I'm just on the attachment that I was sent out. Okay. That's, that's why I'm confused because we're talking, you keep, we keep talking about the Bitter Creek South going in with the roadless, but we have two hunts that once the Bitter Creek South and then once the Bitter Creek, or once the roadless. And they both are October 8th through the October 20th. So if they are, they're different hunts, if we're looking at the rack packet, they will, they may share a hunt boundary. And is one a cow permit? No, they're both hunter's choice. B I six five one nine is the Book Cliffs Little Creek Roadless Hunter's Choice, and B I six five two three is the Book Cliffs Bitter Creek South Hunter's Choice. Yeah, if I could look at, I looked at the map. It made a lot more sense. Yeah. I don't, and I don't have a map in this that they send out. South Hunter's Choice, and then the. Little Creek so, roadless, yeah. So Little Creek is the low road list. The Bitter Creek South is the the, the non portion, the other portion of the hunt. Sometimes we will name them confusing things because we can't put them in and give it its own hunt ID boundary if it has the exact same name. And so the name may be confusing, but we're trying to to name it in a way that it's unique. Okay. And so the the Bitter Creek South hunters they can hunt the roadless. But then the roadless hunters can only. The Bitter hunt Creek the South hunters would not be hunting the roadless. The Bitter Creek South would be hunting the main portion of the book cliffs, the roaded portion north of the ridge. Okay. Bitter Creek, Bitter Creek South is hunting north of the ridge. So, <laughs> so maybe it should be Bitter Creek North. That's why I'm confused. So we are trying, we try to give a, a unique name and description. Sometimes we have different names and they may be listing a pronghorn hunt or we're trying to give it a unique name so it has its own individual hunt ID. And so we may be running into that scenario there, Mike, and I'm sorry, I know that it is confusing. But what you're yeah. proposing is everything north of the ridge, what one we're hunt, everything south yes. of the ridge, including the roadless, another hunt. Yes. Yeah. And I really like that we're like trying to target animals that aren't being hunted. I, I do like that a lot. I just was confused with the names. Yeah, and you know what, in, in trying to respond to you, I think I confused everybody, so. <laughs> Any other questions for Riley? I, I've got another follow-up on that. Go ahead, Scott. Um, is there a difference in draw odds between the previous roadless area? 
are we creating a situation now by putting roads in it that we're gonna change the draw odds of that? Uh, that'd be tough to anticipate, but I don't think so. I, I think our problem and, and part of our desire and wanting to give them more area to hunt is that we are increasing the number of permits. And we, there's a, a part of us that are maybe fearful that we would increase the pressure so much that the bison in the roadless area would move and, and bug out of the area. And so by increasing the area to hunt, it may, it may accept more hunters as a whole. And that's part of the objective and part of the desire. So are they, are they moving out of the unit that's huntable or are they just moving to the northern unit? Sometimes they, we push them so hard they'll even move to the tribe so they are moving out of the area that is huntable. And sometimes they move to the south portion that is underutilized with the other area as well. All right. So go ahead, Ken, and followed by Chase. Yeah, I've had a couple of people ask me, and, and I'm not familiar with the area or, or the way that the bison hunts go, but is there still the over-the-counter bison tags? Yeah. And this does not affect them? No. Thank you. Um, so just to clarify, going off of Scott's question, uh, the, the number of permits for all of the hunts for the once in a lifetime are all decided by the board, correct? Yes. Okay, and then you just make the recommendations and you're, are you, we're increasing the roadless area, you're recommending increasing the roadless area, are you recommending increasing the number of tags on the roadless area? We're not recommending any tag numbers at this tonight. In, in years past, even with the number of permits that we have, even if they stayed status quo, there's a fear that we're pushing bison out of the area and, and moving them into that south portion or off onto the tribe. And so regardless of the number of permits recommended that we feel that this is an appropriate boundary change. Okay. One last question. Um, so is that why the dates are so short? Is so that we don't continually pressure those animals out of the area? Yeah, I mean, when, with bison, we have a number of different permits and there, and we do have you know, try to put smaller number of hunters in each hunt. And so that is part of the strategy between or behind the shorter hunt for sure. Any other questions? Okay, regional supervisor summarize public comments. All right, thank you. We, uh, for the once in a lifetime recommendations, we received six comments online um, and only, and so they were split 50-50. Uh, three had a somewhat agree recommendation and three had a somewhat strong, or a strongly agree recommendation. We had one comment, actual written down comment, and it was uh, talking about the changes they like the changes because it would give people a chance at harvesting these, these animals, more of a chance of harvesting these animals. Okay, uh, we don't have a public comment for, or a public comment for this topic item. In fact, Mr. Dodd, uh, that, that item is no longer on our agenda this week. Uh, I feel like that. You got it. We'll do that after the agenda items and, and you can talk about it. We can hear your concerns. This is a place for you public to express their concerns. Uh, any other, any discussion among the RAC on the once in a lifetime recommendations? So what I have from my notes is that there is a recommendation from the division now that was not presented in the rack packet to eliminate the non-resident hunt on the Camas Chalk Creek mountain goat hunt. Uh, does anybody want to address that? I'd make a motion that we accept the division's recommendation on the Camas. I'll second that. So there's a motion from Mike and second from Ke from Ken that we eliminate the non-resident goat hunt on the Chalk Creek Camas unit. Any discussion on that motion? All in favor, raise your hand. 
Any opposed? Same sign. I, AJ on. Oh, AJ. Join. My hand's raised for, for it. For, perfect. So that's unanimous. Uh, passes unanimously. Um, I'd like to address the, the archery dates on the Nebo. I'd like to make a motion that we not accept the division's recommendation pertaining to the Nebo archery mountain goat hunt and that we ask that they end that hunt on September 30th, which is the day before the any weapon hunt. Yeah. Can I speak to that? I, you bet. I just talked to Rusty and that was not an intent or a typo and so we would be very supportive of that recommendation. So is the, is the intent, Rusty, to switch those two dates or is the intent to... So I, I, I think the intent, uh, the way we did it last year was, um, I believe the, the archery hunt ended on October 1st and the rifle hunt started October 2nd. So with the date shift, that would have the archery hunt ending October 2nd and the rifle hunt picking up October 3rd, which I don't believe is a Sunday. I think that would, so that would I be think my- the I think the second is Saturday and the first is Friday. You looking that right now, Mike? Well, I'm just looking at the. I'm just looking at the other start dates. Oh, um, this is for, so, so October third would be a Monday, so that would be okay to start a, a hunt that day. So okay. Um, so it, I think we have two options: either we we publish that as a typo, or probably the simpler way is if you want to make a recommendation, just to have the rifle hunt start the third instead of the first. That would be the third's a Monday. Yeah, correct. I'd rather start the the any weapon hunt. I don't like it called the rifle hunt because the archers can still hunt that Cor hunt. Correct. So um, just a pet peeve of mine. I'd rather they start on the second. I'd rather they start on the. So you're making the reco recommendation. They just can't start on a Sunday, and October second is a Sunday. Oh, so. is it October first? Okay. 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 So let me just look at see what the division has in there. In theirs. So, would you propose that we edit the recommendation for the archery hunt to end on so September, 30th? September 30th? So, okay, really quick. So the it's next year. Yes, I'm just looking. I'm looking at their dates, not not. So they're recommending that the any weapon hunt start on October 1st. Is that a Saturday? That's a Saturday. Okay, that's what I would like. That's the way they have it in their dates. And so I just want to end the archery hunt on the Friday, which makes the most sense. So you're making a motion that we recommend that the archery hunt ends on 30th of September. Yes, that's the only date changed because their date is okay. October 1st. So there's a motion on the on the table that All we second. recommend that the archery hunt end on 30th September 2022. I'll second it. We've got a second from Ken. Any discussion? I'll call for a vote. Everybody in favor, raise your hand. Aye. Thanks, AJ. Anybody opposed? That also passes unanimously. Any other discussion on the once in a lifetime? If not, I would recommend, I would entertain a motion to accept the remainder as presented. So moved. Thank you. Second. Okay, Ken made the motion and Jim Schuler uh, seconded the motion. Any discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. Aye. Thank you, AJ and Josh. Any opposed? That also passes unanimously. Uh, so we can let Mr. Dodd leave. Why don't I give you three minutes right now to make your comments and then we'll move on to uh, agenda item number eight. So I call up Mr. Dodd for three minutes. Thank you, my name is Mark Dodd. I live in Springville. Uh, I did see here recently uh, the post as I listed on the comment about possible proposed changes for cameras and other technology in hunting. And I am glad that they decided to wait and, and poll some more. Uh, I'd be interested in knowing how that polling has happened. It said they had 6,000 before uh, and gave some results. But I'm reading this and I'm an attorney by trade. So I start nitpicking things when I read it. and it immediately had as a glaring fault. Now, whether you're for or against uh, removing the cameras uh, that can transmit photos immediately, uh, we'll save that for comments on another day. But on the other items, I'm gonna put my glasses on here. The way it read is, 
Another proposed change is not to allow any night vision device to locate or attempt to locate a big game animal. This would go into effect starting 48 hours four, we'll skip that. This includes the use of night vision device, thermal imaging device, infrared imaging device, and other electronic devices that enhance the visible and non-light spectrum. This type of technology has increased. Okay, the way this is written, maybe there's more to it that gets published and sent out that we don't get to see, but almost every camera that I put out has those same technologies. So you're banning the use of any camera by the way it's worded now. Maybe the intent is so someone can't use a monocular, binocular, or some other type of scope or device in order to see with those things for scouting at night. But the way it's written right now, it says you can't use a camera at night. So you're gonna only, you'll have to remove every camera out there the way you currently have this worded. This is poorly done unless your attempt is to remove every camera. And if so, that needs to be made clear that it's not just the cameras that transmit a, a photo when it takes it, it's every camera has to go. The way it's written now, it's, it's very confusing and I think hopefully not intended. Those are my comments. Thank you, Mr. Dodd. We'll make sure that we remember those comments when this does come before the, the rack. I'll do that. Oh, perfect. <laughs> and okay, now we'll move to agenda item number eight, which is uh, the fishing recommendations. That's who it is. That's who it is. Oh, and Craig Walker's here to accept any questions. Uh, questions from the rack regarding the fishing recommendations. I think there were two major changes. One was to allow the harvest of any two cutthroat trout in Bear Lake, and the other one was to postpone the opening of fishing on the pond at Willard Bay until September of next year. Is that correct? Correct. Question for you. Sure. Uh, whether, we, whether Utah makes this recommendation change or not to Bear Lake, Idaho is making this change either anyway, correct? If it passes for them, yeah. They go through so a similar they, they have a motion to, to going through for this? Yeah, okay. be, being in interstate water, we try to actually manage, you know, with the same regulations across those two state boundaries, so yes. If, if the motion does not pass, or if, we, if the board does not accept the recommendation, uh, will Idaho honor that as well, or? or it depends on if their board passes it or not. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it, it, we, we try to defend it as much as possible. And I think the research that we've done, um, the work that we've done on Lake with our special project up there with Scott Tolentino, uh, definitely points to the fact that this is justified. Uh, it puts us in a position where we are addressing some of the strategic objectives that we have as a section and a division, which is to basically allow natural reproduction to provide fishing resources for anglers moving forward, which gives us enough freeboard in our hatcheries to maybe put fish in waters where we don't have that capability. So uh, that's no different than what Idaho is dealing with, and it's one of the reasons why we decided to move at this time, based upon the information that we have that says that we could actually afford up to uh, a three fish limit and still allow for these uh, naturally reproduced cuts to be kept, so. Other questions for Craig? Mike first and then Ken. I just, I like what Chase brought up. Has, so has Utah been working hand in hand with Idaho on that management strategy? Yeah, we, we try to work hand in glove with Arizona, uh, Wyoming and Idaho on the three interstate waters that we have in Utah. Um, most times with Idaho, we're successful. Wyoming, maybe not so much, but we try every time, yes. Yeah, Craig, did I understand right? We got 60% natural recruitment. Uh, we are in that range, yeah, 50 to 60 Which is really fantastic. Which is pretty amazing. I think, it, it again, it indicates to us that that population can definitely withstand uh, a little bit of exploitation and they'll be fine, so. And, and clipping the adipose fin would, do you think that's where, where it got us? Would that work on other waters? eventually or? Uh, yeah, I mean, any study where we're differentially marking naturally reproduced fish with hatchery stocked fish uh, allows us to do that assessment for sure, absolutely. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Okay, uh, turn the time over to Jason to present the public comments. All 
All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. On this, we also had six um, uh, responses that came in. Uh, we had 33% were strongly disagree, 33% strongly agree, 16% somewhat agree, and then another 16% uh, were neutral, neither agreed or disagreed. Um, and that's just, just one comment about how much experience the person didn't really have on these waters, but like the changes. Yeah, and, and just as, a, as an aside, that does dovetail with what we found in the statewide survey where we had, you know, upwards of 3,000 respondents. I forget what the exact number is, but, um, you know, we were in that 70%, 75% in support of, uh, and when I mean, when I say in support of, I mean neutral all the way up to extremely supportive, so. Including all seven respondents from Rich County. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say that our survey results are a little bit more robust than maybe the, the six or seven that we got there, yeah. Well, Craig, I, I think it's a great idea. And I kind of think that I wish it could have happened sooner because I, I, I think it will help the fishermen out a little bit. Yeah, it, it, you know, we were talking about this the other day. I think it, it sets us up, and you brought it up, can that it sets us up to begin doing this at other waters. We are in a situation where, as you guys know, we, we have a growing population and a pretty stable participation rate, as I've mentioned to this group and others before. Um, that means we're gonna have increased angling out on the landscape and we need to figure out how we're going to provide the fish for those anglers with the existing hatcheries that we have. And we need to harness natural reproduction where possible. So this is a really, really great effort that dovetails with, like I said, our strategic objectives. I have one more quick question. Absolutely. I think that's appropriate. Um, do the hatchery stocked fish, do they, are they spawning alongside the, the naturally spawned fish? Do we know that? I mean, is that part of why the recruitment is higher is because they're reproducing also? I, I think that when you augment a population, yes. Um, when you have fertile individuals, they're doing that and, you know, building through time. So either through stocking or through natural recruitment, we're able to, um, you know, increase that amount of natural reproduction we see on the landscape for sure. Yes, but 60% but natural recruitment is fantastic. Strawberries under 50. And, and so, and, and they have a really good facility up there to do it. So I, I think it's a great move. Just uh, one other thing to mention that I've got in some notes that these guys wanted me to point out. Um, you know, the, the study that we did through uh, University of Idaho, uh, Mike Quist is a, a professor, a friend of mine up there, uh, really robust work. And I mentioned that it indicated that we could actually allow for three trout to be harvested. Um, we're not recommending that change, but it does indicate to us that we have freeboard within the population of fish to accommodate even more anglers. So it's really good, you know, we have that natural recruitment going on, enough so to sustain the amount of angling that we see currently, but also enough so that we're gonna be able to sustain that moving forward, which is really cool, so. Hey, Thank hey, you. hey Brock. Go ahead, Josh. To, to follow up on my question, and, and this is a question I don't know, I'm curious. Is there competition when it comes to reproduction between hatchery and native fish, or is it, since it's the same species, do they sort of um, fertilize an egg the same that a, that a, that a natural one would? I, I don't know. Uh, I'm gonna say that there's overlap. I don't know that we identified that in the study specifically, but if you look at our cutthroat trout brood lakes that we augment and, and restock, um, those stocked fish actually come back and intermingle and reproduce with the fish that have persisted in there for, you know, two, three, four years, so. That, my guess is the cutthroat from Bear Lake are the source of roe for the hatchery, is that correct? Yeah. So they're the same fish, really. They are, and they don't, you know, they don't swim out there and go, eh, wait a second, you're not a hatchery fish, I can't spawn with you, I'm sorry, so. Thank you, okay. Uh, we have no public comments, so I'll turn it over to the, the rack for discussion on these two recommendations. 
And if there is none, I'd entertain a motion. I'll make a motion that we accept the division's proposal as presented. I'll second. So we have a proposal from Ken that we accept the recommendations as presented, seconded by Chase. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor, raise your hand. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. That passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. I don't have anything else on the agenda. Does somebody have anything they want to bring up that we would like to discuss tonight? Hey, hey Brock, I have one more question. Yeah, Josh. I, I wanted to ask this when Jason was given his overview earlier, and since Craig is here and we got a fishery guy, um, I, I guess my question has to do with the liberal um, quotas that were set by emergency drought conditions this season. Since we got some fishery guys in the room, I'm, I'm just curious, like, What's the status of our lakes and reservoirs and streams? Like, are we gonna be okay next year? I, 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 get, I guess Jason brought it up and I wanted to ask it then and I didn't raise my hand quick enough because I'm on nine and there's a delay. But do you feel like um, we're okay going into next year? Like 20, 20 plus reservoirs had liberal quotas that, that got enacted. I mean, how are we doing? I'm just curious because I think everybody's scratching their head that doesn't uh, hold a, a fisheries degree right now. Sure. Great question, Josh. I, it could have been that I ignored you when I saw you raise your hand too, not just that. <laughs> no. <laughs> so uh, liberalization of harvest is not something we approach lightly at all. Uh, those fish are expensive to, to produce. Um, like I said, we have limited hatchery capacity and uh, we don't just quote unquote, like to waste them, uh, if you will, uh, in trying to liberalize limits. Um, but we, uh, in our estimate, figure that it's better to put them in an, in an angler's freezer than it is to make them part of the uh, sediment. And that's where would, they would end up in many cases in a lot of the reservoirs and uh, the lake elevations that we're seeing this year are just, you know, something we haven't seen before. Uh, so we did it in a, a very, we did it in a stepwise manner. Uh, we did three individual uh, examinations and that gave us in our minds the flexibility to maybe back off on some of those if we saw water conditions improving. In many instances, we didn't, as you guys know. Um, so our mindset moving forward is, yes, we are hopeful that we're going to get snow. Uh, the NOAA forecast that I've seen indicates that it is going to be drier than normal, warmer than normal. So the likelihood that that's going to happen um, is probably pretty low. With that in mind, we've come to the, the understanding that this isn't just a one-off, that we are indeed in the 20th out of 22 years of a what's termed a mega drought, right? This is a long-term thing and also that this is probably going to be the new norm that we're going to struggle with moving forward. With that mindset, uh, and I think for those of you that were present at the rack and board training or saw that, uh, drought was the case study that we gave of our process. Uh, we are going to be doing this in a strategic fashion. We're going to be looking at what triggers we might be able to identify early on in a year, specifically snowpack, that might give us an indication as to what we wanna do moving forward as far as how we outlet those fish from our hatcheries to various waters. Uh, we do not wanna approach this in an emergency reg fashion moving forward. It just doesn't make any sense either for the anglers, for you as rack and board members, or for us as managers. So hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. Go ahead, Ken. It was just brought to my attention. Uh, of course, we have a lot more anglers in Strawberry than than uh, Bear Lake, but we have a lot of cutthroat in Strawberry too. But the natural recruitment in Strawberry is thirty percent. Any other items of discussion for the rack? So, I move to adjourn. All in favor? Okay, we're adjourned. We can stop that. And then I think you have a comment, no?
Okay.